You are listening to Small Business Straight Talk with your host, Amber Delagarza. Amber is a sought after coach, trainer, speaker, and writer who gives small business owners the straight talk on productivity, time management, business systems, leading your teams, strategic decision making, and mindset. No BS, fluff, or overused jargon, just actionable strategies to get results and succeed in business. And here is your host, Amber Delagarza, the productivity specialist. Welcome, and thank you for listening to the Small Business Straight Talk podcast. Today is episode 327, Preparing to Sell Your Business, Practical Approaches with Malcolm Peace. If you're a business owner who wants to learn effective business strategies, improve time management, and elevate productivity to maximize profits, reduce stress, and make time for what matters most, then you're in the right place, and I'm so glad you've joined me. I'm looking forward to you meeting our guest, Malcolm Peace. Malcolm is making Texas feel smaller with his fantastic work with small to mid-sized businesses throughout the state. His company, Sit Sarah Growth Partners, works with well-established businesses with owners who are just about to retire but still want to see their businesses thrive. Malcolm and his team help rewrite the operating playbook while maintaining the owner's culture with a strong success plan. With their experience and focus on operational excellence, they strive to double the company's revenue in just two short years. The work is intensive, but Malcolm and his team put all the tools in place to give the owner peace of mind that their business will grow faster for years to come. In this episode with Malcolm, I was looking forward to talking to him all about what does it take for a business owner to prepare to sell their business. And whether you're looking to sell your business or not, the tips Malcolm is giving are incredible about being process-driven, profitable, not being the bottleneck or center of the business where the business cannot function without you. No matter what stage of business you're in, there is sound advice that you can implement in your business at any stage. Before we jump into my conversation with Malcolm, I want to invite you to take my next level business owner quiz. Three short minutes and you can discover what is most holding you back in your business. Then you'll get a personalized playlist to help you solve those exact pain points. You'll get a curated playlist of episodes that address those challenges with solutions that you can implement right away. Head on over to amberdelagarza.com forward slash quiz. Again, that's amberdelagarza.com forward slash quiz. And now, let's meet our guest and get to the straight talk. Welcome, Malcolm. Thanks for being here today. Uh, Before we get started and talking about uh, what we have up for our listeners today, I'd love for you to share a little bit about yourself that we didn't hear in your official bio and maybe why you're passionate about talking about long-term strategies over short-term strategies. Yeah, thanks, Amber. Real honor to be here. I, uh, you know, candidly, I think the thought process there is you make different decisions dependent on, you know, what your ultimate outcome goal is. And candidly, the compression of time that you have to achieve those goals. If you're telling me, you know, you want to launch a business tomorrow and you want to scale it up to $10 million in a year, like you make different decisions versus we're buying businesses that are in existence for longer than 10 years that have probably plateaued over the number of years. They maybe hit the threshold that that previous business owner was capable of doing. And we want to run them for next decades to come. So we make different decisions in light of that. We often have to think about, you know, what's the missing gaps that are right now, um, but also at the same time, you know, what are the decisions we got to make to stabilize this business thinking long term, um, whether it be introducing a new product line or introducing more aspects to the products that are already in existence and really trying to find greater value for our customers. So we make those decisions differently um, than maybe somebody else might do, depending on the timeline that they have and the goals that they have at the end of the day. Okay. How did you get into buying businesses? Yeah, so I was working with two partners originally um, based out of here in Austin, Texas, and we were buying food and beverage and hospitality type businesses and all kind of B2C type businesses. And no no knock on that space, but it's hard, man. Mm. When you're waking up to Google reviews and wondering what the heck happened, uh, somebody had some bad experience and you didn't even know it take place under your own roof. 
you know, that's, that's the issue that we kept running against um, that yeah. I really struggled with internally where I was like, Hey, hold on a second. Like if I want to have kind of internal peace on a day-to-day basis, I want to not run what I like to call Google review type businesses, business to consumer, B2C type businesses and more B2B type businesses. And, and what ended up happening was, is as we were building these hospitality facilities, uh, we were building wedding and corporate events and all this kind of stuff in the Texas Hill Country. I was interacting with a lot of blue collar, industrial, kind of B to B kind of businesses over and over again, whether it was the guy installing our septic tanks or the guy doing our core sampling or the gal coming and doing and looking at our space and how it would work and all this kind of stuff. It just, you know, kept over and over and over again running into these folks. And one key conversation that I had was we had a constraint with the fire department on how our roads were have to be built and all this kind of stuff. So we were, we were working with a roll off dumpster and a porta potty company. And I kept having these conversations with the guy to kind of figure out how we were going to make this all work. Um, accessibility to all the things they needed accessibility to and the fire department. And I was like, wait a second, the software that we have built for acquiring businesses and building the businesses that we were already doing, I wonder if this guy was doing that kind of stuff. And so I I just started picking his brain and saying, you know, hey, what's your customer acquisition process? What do you guys do? Come to find out there's a ton of need in this blue collar industrial kind of B2B space for what I like to call the up leveling or the sophistication being brought to them. So that's not that's not a short story, but a long story of, you know, we we essentially were able to see there was a huge need for us to come in and bring value to this space um, through software and standard operating procedures and enabling these businesses into the 21st century. Okay. So you see an opportunity where the business owner has gotten to a point where they want to sell their business, uh, get acquired, yeah. versus having coaching or seeing what these gaps are and fixing them themselves. So what brings a business owner to that point? And do you find that that was always their end goal to sell or this opportunity came and they took it? Yeah, great question. So we, to be straight and direct about it, we end up uh, working with a lot of business owners that face the three Ds. Um, They face death, the reality of life ending at some point, Mm -hmm. and when they've spent all this time building their business, they end up coming across life um, challenges or unexpected moments like divorce, or they come up with moments of just disinterest in their business. They've been running it for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they've just lost interest and they want to put their passion into something else and they've never really found a solution out of it. So we end up becoming that solution in some ways where we can say, hey, I love your brick manufacturing company, your stainless steel manufacturing company, your niche service business or whatever it may be, we come in and we'll take it over and we'll carry on that baton building upon what you've already built. And that's that's the key differentiator is that we have no intention of selling them when we first buy. Our goal is how do we build a long-term business? And I always took it as how do I build a business that my kids still know about in 10 years time? They know that I'm passionate about it, excited about it. And we get to add tangible value on a regular basis rather than paying this very passive approach. We roll up our sleeves and get involved. We buy a majority interest in these businesses and we interact with a lot of folks to your question about they're coming, going through these transition points in life and we can solve that solution for them. Yeah, I know that there's a lot of business owners that have spent their best years, right? When they're raising kids and newly married and all of these prime times in our lives that have been invested in growing a business and maybe not a lot of thought about what happens to the business when I retire or when I want to retire. And for some, they've gotten to that season of their life where they're thinking, what would that look like if I sold it? And sometimes they're asking that question too late in the game. So I'm curious, what would a business owner be looking at when they're thinking long term, they want to build an asset that can pay them into the future. So let's say they can retire. Uh, What does a business look like that would be um, attracted? What are your metrics that you're looking at? Yeah, great question. We, um, so I, I have, very simple frameworks, in my opinion, because they they, they have to make sense to me. Um, and so I look at, you know, we call it a decentralized business. So most businesses doing, you know, low seven figures or below are often very centralized businesses. There's somebody kind of the energy mm-hmm. in the middle. They're the one that's making those decisions. They have, um, you know, all the autonomy and ability to and authority to make those decisions and everything kind of flows through them. We take businesses that are often at that point and we create a decentralized business. And the way that that looks is essentially 
day, you know, call it 12, typically somewhere around there, we'll have a family lunch, sit down with the team and we're, and we're showing them an organization chart that they've probably never seen before. They probably have some loose title. They don't know who they really report to, but they've got some sort of sense. And we kind of, we create some uh, cemented aspects of it. And often I explain to them, Hey, I'm not on that org chart, even though that I am the owner of the business. Now I'm not on that org chart. Nothing flows through me necessarily. I play key roles to kind of move the ball forward. And mm -hmm. those key roles typically are from a top-down perspective on a profit and loss statement. So to your question is, when I'm looking to transition out of a business, what are the things that I'm looking for when I see a business that may or may not be attractive? I'm looking at what's the predictability on revenue, because if I can keep that predictable and, and get some semblance around that, there's a lot better likelihood this business transitions well. And then we move our way down the profit and loss statement, depending on the you know, business that you work in, there usually is some cost of goods that it's related to that. And that's where we look at what's what does that profit margin look like? How, you know, manageable is that? Are you always having to find new people to replace the heads that you are working with to be able to pull off that service or that product that you're producing? What does that all look like? And so that when I'm evaluating a business, I take the framework of let me go down the profit and loss statement from a risk perspective. I'm less worried about how does the person move around the documents um, that relate to managing this project day to day? I'm not worried about that. We can solve that later and, and clean that up. But if there's not predictable revenue or some sort of revenue process in place that I can understand and wrap my arms around, there's a lot higher likelihood that this business doesn't transition very well. Okay, so I want to make sure I understand. Uh, when you acquire businesses, are you saying the business owner stays in the business and you redo the org chart or your team comes in? Just yeah, my my team comes in. Great question. Okay. Um, like I said, a lot of the business owners that we work with kind of face these life moments. So they often are looking to transition out. Maybe they stay on for a year or two, or there's some key employees that are related to them. Maybe, you know, some family member that's been in the business for a while that stays on as well, that was key to what's going on. But more often than not, they've all kind of reached that point and they say, we don't have a secession plan. We don't have something necessarily we can, you know, we don't have somebody we can necessarily pass this on to. So we come in as that quasi, you know, son, niece, nephew, or daughter that they've always wanted to be able to sell to. And that tends to resonate really well when I say, hey, like, we're here to honor what you've done. Uh, mm -hmm. What you've built is really unique and special. And it often took a huge sacrifice on your family. And, you know, our goal is to come in with that different skill set to kind of up level the business from where you got it to. Yeah. So I find it interesting that you used a centralized versus decentralized. When I hear centralized, it means that somebody, a key person, usually the owner is the bottleneck to growth ideas, um, decision making, that the business can't outgrow their own per personal skill set development, right? So it's very centralized. And why wouldn't you want a business that worked on being more decentralized so that when you came in, you know it wasn't going to crash and burn because that central entity wasn't there? Yeah, great question. So we come in with standard operating procedures and processes with software that we implement. So we've got our 100 day plan. It's all of our website and stuff. Like we really try to implement a game plan and we look to does this business have the ability to make that transition? So yes, to your point, I am kind of balancing two ends of it where I have to say, okay, this business is centralized. Can it transition to a decentralized? And what's the risk profile from doing that? How you know interactive is this owner with major customers or whatever yeah. the case may be? Like all those things come into play when we're evaluating it. But when we boils down to it, like most people that get to this point they either are unaware that they need to make this move or this change, or they need to hire what I like to call heads of state. They, they typically hire more hands just to do other things, right? They're like, oh, I need somebody to run this machine, or I need this person to go install this new thing or whatever it case may be. They just hire more uh, hired hands. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they don't tend to bring on higher heads of state because one, they may not know how to interact with that type of person, or two, they think that they need to compensate them in a way that's like really complicated when reality, it's like, hey, if you rev share with this guy, like, or this gal, that's a head of state kind of person, and they get to ride along with you on the upside and the downside, they pretty much are self inclined to, to do as hard as they can do to, to, you know, get the best outcome for everybody. So there's, there's a lot of complexity that's really kind of talked about, that's not necessary. And at the end of the day, if you get those people on the team, you'll end up raising the bar, but a lot of business owners don't do that, either because they're really happy with what's going on, whether they you know, made some good money and they're comfortable and it's more than they ever expected. Or mm -hmm. it would take a little bit of um, them being uncomfortable to raise that level, awkward conversations, 
find a headhunter that would hire somebody that's a little bit better, convince somebody to be a part of a team where you don't have a stocked fridge and you have to convince them to, you know, wear a shirt that's a little more grungy than you may get, you know, working somewhere else or whatever it may be, right? That's part of those uncomfortable moments that I think keep people in that centralized business. Okay. So what advice do you give business owners to build a business that is long-term thinking versus short-term? It's kind of a twofold question. And what are some of the traps you see business owners get into when they're consistently looking at short-term solutions? I think that a lot of business owners deal with what's right in front of them because it's it feels good to complete things in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a there's a snowball effect um, to project management. There's a snowball effect to producing things where you knock out the little ones and it feels kind of good and you get this momentum. I often find that a lot of business owners, they get a bunch of little momentum in the day or they get some things thrown at them that they have to complete or an answer they have to do or they tell the office manager to pay that bill or whatever it may be. And then at the end of the day, they have that big project that would really move the needle that they've always kind of had lingering in the back of their mind or they've discussed with a friend or you know somebody internally. Yeah. And they just don't do it. And then the next day starts again. And then you have that little snowball again where you knock out a bunch of small things and maybe a little bit harder things. And then there's that big one that you're supposed to do again and you just don't do it. And so, but to their credit, they've built a business that may, in our case, are often producing you know, million dollars net profit to them in a lot of cases. And so they've done really well, more than they probably ever expected to do. And like, not not saying it's an ego thing. It's a it's it's a natural thing of like, hey, this is more than I ever thought I would achieve. Why create more headaches for myself? I oh, I could go add in this aspect to our machinery or you know, whatever the case may be. Like recently we took a business that had a same design for 30 to 40 years and we're adding IoT software, Internet of Things of software into the machinery. It never been done. It's happening all over our industry, but it never been done with the designs that that we have. And if we can add that onto a very proven machinery and has this great reputation, I think we can create greater value for our customer. It's taking me hours and hours and hours. It's taking me a bunch of teammates to convince them to go take, pull them off the other things to focus on this. And we're getting to this point where like, it's all starting to come together. And so um, I, I just, you know, no disrespect to any business owner. I get where they're at. I just want to take this business and drive the next you know phase forward. So that's where we focus. Yeah. I mean, service-based business owners essentially are the skill set. Like they built the thing that delivers the service and you can kind of build that habit of staying in that role. It's a comfortable role. It's a familiar role and you're pretty, probably pretty damn good at that role. Yep. Right. Um, yep. But what I heard you say is that the content, the it's fine and not prioritizing working on the business when there's not an imminent deadline. There's not yeah. a fire, an urgency. And what I'm hearing is that you and your team come in and because you're not drowning in the details, right? And the day-to-day operational, that you can really clearly see what things need to be a priority to work on the business versus in the business. Yeah. Yeah, we do that in two parts. One is we take our employees and we delever them. So what I mean by that is when I step into a business, if I've got employees doing certain things, I may know how to do partly what they do. I might know generally what they do or how they do it. But if I've grown up in the business, I tend to know a lot of what they do and I'm just constantly finding new hands to do what they're supposed to do and I'm constantly monitoring whether or not they do those types of things. So we switch it where I am delevering the business in our favor to the business owner by standardizing what they do and documenting every single thing that they do in standard operating procedures. So we, no secret, we take three to four virtual assistants, implement them right into the business. They've been trained prior to acquisition and we jump straight into taking information from employees' brains. It probably feels so weird. I know it feels so weird. I've been told it feels so weird where you're being interviewed immediately. Tell me what you do, where you use this document, all this kind of stuff. And I have to constantly go on the back end and reassure everybody, hey, you're not losing your job. We're just trying to get a sense and wrap our arms around this thing because they've never gone through an acquisition board. So they don't know what this typically is like, to, uh, you know, most cases. And so we come in and we say, hey, let me get all that information. So what ends up happening is once we start running full speed, 
then they can go through the process of deciding, hey, do I want to be a part of this or not? And we've delevered that issue, or de 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 create less leverage in their favor for that situation. And so that's how we do it. And it allows us to be in a little bit more commanding position. And then what we do on the back end of that is we create KPIs for that person and allow them to be objectively measured. And so we've not risked the business by measuring them and saying, hey, you're not doing a great job. We are also at the same time giving them direct feedback and letting them self-attest how they truly believe they're doing. Okay. So I believe that SOPs and processes are an asset in the business and it's just for that. Now you're using words like deleverage and I'm saying you're shifting the risk. The yep. biggest risk to any business owner is that a team member that has all the knowledge and experience or carries a heavy lift on a particular important area of the business, decides they're leaving or heaven forbid, gotten a, a car accident. Like that is a real risk to the revenue and profitability when it all lives in very few people. Again, centralized. Uh, so when you go in and do this, I am so curious because before starting this company, I did consulting. And when I did consulting, it was about processes and systems and companies and corporations. Oh. And what I would do is literally go and sit next to somebody. This was before virtual assistants. This is like 15 yep. years ago. I would go and sit next to people in their cubicles. And I always like think back of this dance. Like I had to get them talking. I had to get the knowledge out. I had to ask questions that to me were obvious. Yep. Like, well, why do you produce that report? And I'd always hear, because we've always done it that way, because mm -hmm. I was told to do it that way, right? Yep. So you start asking questions. But the whole other side of that, the people side to that is how do you do it so that they don't feel um, intimidated? Because you're never going to get accurate information if you can't balance the two. Uh, yeah. So share with us how you balance that culture and you get them to buy into obviously getting bought out. I don't know if that's the language you would use, sure. bought in. Yeah. To have new ownership. How do you get them to collaborate? Because if I'm looking at this, that's a huge risk, like yeah. huge. You got team members walking out faster you can, than you can get the knowledge out of their head. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a true reality. Right. And, but in my belief that can happen at any point in the business, whether it's transitioned or not. No, and 100%. I think, and I think, yeah. yeah. And I think that that is a decision someone's made prior to an acquisition. Um, I had a buddy just recently, he bought a, another landscaping company. And the first day he had three people leave. Like Ooh. he was having the opening meeting on a Monday about here I am, who I am. And yeah. people in the meeting put their hand up and said, I'm done. And they just left. And so like there, there is, that is going to, that's going to happen. Yeah. I'm going to be ultimately surprised all the time by why people choose to leave um, for all sorts of reasons, but I'm letting them self-discover that in their own way. We want to retain people as much as possible. That skill set and that ability to do what you've already done and to be able to be invested in and continue to develop, those are like vital aspects that I want to hold on to as much as possible. And yeah. I've been surprised in many cases when someone sits down and says, you know, hey, I think I've you know, done my time here and I'm I'm ready to move on. And like, oh, okay, I'm really surprised. I thought we were investing. This is what I asked you, you know, the vision I had for you and asked you to step apart of and be a part of, and you chose not to. And that, that's always a surprising thing to me. But to yeah. answer your question, you know, more directly, the way we do that is allowing them to have greater vision into what is the ultimate vision for this company and let them be a part of that. Hey, this is what it looks like. We created org chart. Here's everybody to report to. Hey, does this seem familiar to you? Like, do you, do you know you report to this person? And we sit down over a family meal very soon in the process and start letting them know, hey, this is what it's going to look like. Things aren't going to change. You know, things aren't going to change from my structure from your day to day, but I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions to better, to better understand. Doesn't mean you're fired. I'm not trying to cut jobs. I want to retain as many jobs as possible, all those types of things. But then the analogy I often use is if we're going to go with that framework from a top-down P&L approach, I like to call it the plumber analogy. Whether you push water or air down a pipe, you end up figuring out the leaks. And so what ends up happening a lot of the time is that we try to crank up sales very quickly at the beginning so that I can see operationally all that SOP stuff that needs to be gathered, what needs to be caught. And so that's how we do it. And people start yeah. recognizing, oh, snap. If Malcolm brings in even, even more revenue, I'm going to be even more stressed. I don't have these systems. I don't have these processes. I don't know how to handle this. I'm just going to get more and more stressed out because we build businesses often that are just heavily dependent on people's labor per day. And as a result, those businesses end up being stifled or people just, you know, get burnt out or whatever the case may be. So yeah, it's a balancing but, act, but that's how we think about it. For sure. Okay. That's a couple points to that. So one, I call that stress testing. 
right? So you create a process. It's only as good as how it performs under a stress test. Yeah. Like, like what is your highest, highest, whatever your busiest season? Can it work? Most systems are created in um, calm times because that's the time you have to create the systems, but yeah. they really have to be stress tests. So I love that analogy of like testing it because you could analyze it and not pick the thing that needs to be fixed. And now you've yep. wasted your time. There's not an ROI. So when you stress test it, it's coming to light. And I think there's a lot to be said. Like if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh my gosh, like I have to create processes and SOPs. Yeah, like, I mean, it is shit. Like it's hard, <laughs> but it's an asset and it'll start telling you where to invest your time. Yeah. And energy. Um, I wanted to just speak back to the culture. So in my experience working with my clients, when I was like, you know, if it's suggested that they need to create processes and yeah. SOPs, one of the fears that come up is what we just spoke about was like, they're going to get uncomfortable, the employee, like they're getting questioned, what, like they're going to think they're getting fired. And the advice I always give is to frame it that you're questioning the process, not the person. Yeah. And continually say that and, and continually get them to buy in because whether we as business owners remember being employees or not, mm -hmm. if you think back, you probably had a lot of good ideas and a lot of frustrations that, that were there because of inefficiency or lack of processes. Uh, so I find that when you can get them to buy into improving the process and they're not being questioned, you can get a lot of good information by just asking the right questions. Yeah. One one of the things that um, is key that was really well said. One of the things that's key in that when you go sit down somebody's cubicle, or I come into a business that I've never seen or run before. Um, what becomes very natural and intuitive for those that have been around for a while is very um, you know foreign, right? In many many ways. And so as a result, that's always this, the stress test for me too. Is like okay, if I had to take your role and multiply it three times, and I had new people stepping in, what's the onboarding process to get these people up and running? Um, are they just going to fall into the same thing of oh, this is the way we always done it, and it's very inefficient, and all these types of things? Like they probably will because you've never really refined it. And so mm -hmm. I, I heard someone say this one time it was probably in a book too um business is the infinite game like it is a constant thing you're always doing it's not this like all of a sudden you get to a point it becomes steady state and it's fine like no it's a constant thing that's being evolving that's right. and going and um a lot of business owners we interact with um they get certain aspects of the business to a certain point and then they just step back. They don't think intuitively about how do I improvise on this one, improve this one aspects. They just kind of move on to the next thing because candidly, you're like taking something that had no form and you're creating form around it for so long with so much energy from yourself that eventually you have to move on to the next thing. So no discredit to them. We're just at a, when we're looking at businesses, three to 12 million in revenue is, is the ones that we typically look at. Like they, they have a little bit of structure around them and they need to be able to go to that next level. So you have to create even more structure. And so we can focus on certain things. Absolutely. So when you said that you uh, set metrics and KPIs and that you're looking for a long term, you're, you're, you're purchasing these companies, you want them to succeed in the long term. Um, what, how do you determine your own success? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So I had a I had a moment that I loved and it sounds really bad in hindsight for some folks maybe listening. Um, but I had a, a guy get very upset with me, mouth off, walk off during the middle of the day. And then I had another guy that had an issue. They were having a conflict and I got involved in the conflict. And uh, one guy in the middle of, you know, discussing with one other um, decided to mouth me off and walk off. Mm -hmm. um, didn't come back to work you know, basically told me he was going to file for unemployment. And I said, you're not able to do that because you left. Um, no one forced you to leave. You decided to leave in the middle of the day. Then calls me back three days later and asks for his job again. And we had filled it already by then. And so um, that was the moment where I was like, hey, like this is the reality of a business that's run well, where we can recruit on a consistent basis, because I don't think recruiting should happen when you have a need. Recruiting should be happening constantly because you should be iterating and improving on the team constantly and looking for that person that's going to take the business forward. Again, not just hired hands. Even if you have somebody that's an analyst role or someone that's in, you know, a, a handyman role or whatever the case may be, you want to find somebody that's able to go with you and journey with you to the infinite game that you're producing. And so as a result, we're constantly recruiting. We're constantly yeah. engaging um, to be able to do that, that we had people teed up ready to go. 
And we were able to make two or three phone calls and we had somebody filled in by three days. And the guy, we have a policy if you don't show up after three days. So we were, we were making phone calls while he wasn't showing up. And so, um, you know, all that to be said, like he was, it was filled and that was a, you know, I, I hope he's doing well, but at the end of the day, like that's, I think that's my responsibility to the rest of the team to create that process where we can replace and go through it and, and add more team members that are high quality folks on a pretty quick basis. And so, Anyways, I that's my metric love for that. that. I was not expecting that answer of success. I love that answer. And uh, we'll link to it in the show notes. But I do have a, an episode where I, it's called Always Be Hiring. Hmm. And I talk about like as small business owners, generally what we see is somebody quits and then they're writing the job description and then they're doing the ads and they're like way behind the eight ball, right? Because recruiting itself can take some time. And I also find that if you don't have that mentality like you do of always be hiring, um, that situation would have looked different. You would have been desperate. <laughs> you would have yeah. been like, sure, come back. And now you yeah. got dysfunction in the, in the company. Uh, yeah. And unfortunately, as you know, that because you consider that success, a lot of business owners, that is their reality is they're, they're dealing with people on their team that are not the best fit because they're not prioritizing creating, you know, processes for hiring, yes, but also the confidence that they can fill that role really clearly because they even know what that role does. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, yeah. it's, it's funny, you know, what happens is, yeah. I think everything is an interesting equation when you think about business. And so if I'm saying, oh my gosh, this person, I found them, they came through our recruiting process. They are a rock star. I don't have a space for them on the org chart, but I just have to find a way to get him on here. We get them on there. What does that cause me to do? It causes me to go push sales a little bit further, right? I'll find a solution to cover the debt that I just created with this person coming on the payroll. Yeah. I'm going to figure that out. And so I think if you're constantly like, hey, this is an infinite process that we're going through and constantly, constantly, constantly trying to be a part of, you know, building people that are doing excellent things together, you end up with a result of you make these different decisions versus you're always reacting to what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So based on your answers, I've got to ask, you must have some sort of prioritizing the sales and marketing because your answer to break stuff is sales and marketing and your answer to fix things is sales and marketing. So I, I, I'm guessing there's something yeah. here. So what do you want to share with us about the importance of sales and marketing? Yeah, I think um, I think sales and marketing is key. I think it's um, the beginning of everything for a business in a lot, a lot of ways. I think that you've got to be able to service well um, for sure. And that's kind of the second rung. So I, I again, I break down the PL in three sections. I think of it always as revenue, mix of revenue, where's the revenue coming from? Can we actually get, you know, receivables back from customers, all those types of things, healthiness of that revenue. And then there's the cost of goods, which is usually the servicing of that product or that service. Um, and so all that to be said, I tend to, you know, make sure that our health of our revenue is really, really good. And I'm constantly improving that process, make it easier for our guys, Often the sales guys in our orgs are paid the most, and I have no you know issue with that because they are the ones that create stability down the PL. That's just the way that I think about it. And so yeah. when I go to the team and I say, hey, this quarter didn't go well, I don't look at them and say, hey, it's because you weren't welding really well or you weren't doing this really well. It's these sale guys didn't do what they were supposed to. And I'm letting you know that they missed the ball and they are responsible for your livelihoods. So let's be all kind of camaraderie together about pulling this off together by communicating to them, you know, hey, I can I can pull this off. We can do this. We can fit this in the timeline. We can, you know, move this project around, all that kind of stuff to enable our sales guys to have no roadblocks when they're negotiating. So anyways, that's the way we think about yeah. it. Um, and, I, I, you know, we, we do a lot of bunch of different things to pull that off, not to get to the nitty gritty of it. But I definitely believe in that framework of PNL top down. Okay. So do you consider the labor cost part of cost of goods sold? Absolutely. And that's yeah. the way a PL should run. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I, exactly I softballed that to you. I yeah, wanted yeah. you to say that to the audience because oh, yeah. a normal PL, that's not where it shows up. So yeah. I just want to, you alluded to it. I want you to call it out. So, yeah. how do you determine which labor? So, let's say you have a front desk person and they're the receptionist. Is that closest to the plumber that's actually doing the service? Do you consider it all labor? Or cost yeah, we, goods. yeah, definitely. We separate those two. Um, I think of anybody that is touching the service or the product that you're creating on a mm. consistent basis and their job is measured by that. 
they are in cost of labor. And I think I can justify that with the IRS. Um, yeah. So that's the, that's the way we think about it, right? And yeah. so a receptionist, yes, they have an experience, but their job is to make sure that then it gets passed on to whoever is enabling that service or whatever the case may be. They're enabling the internal functions. They're not enabling the experience with the customer nine times out of 10. Maybe they do when and people say feedback. So that one's you're making me think. Maybe there's some gray area there. But um, you know, truth be told, anybody that touching or or enabling the yeah. service or creating the, the product, we put them within cost of goods sold um, in order to you know convey to them, hey, this is where you fit in the structure of all the things that we do. Yeah. And it's, we, go ahead. You know, I'm just saying we have another interview with another guest that talks about that, and the reason I brought it up is because time, right? Like I talk a lot about time management and time and tracking time, and you that's the actual thing you're selling. Like, I don't care what industry you're in, you're selling time. And so you have to understand what that's costing you for each person and how that actually touches the product or service. So you're just reiterating, I'm pulling it together with some episodes so people can hear how freaking important it is. I don't care what industry you're in, you're selling time. You got to understand where it's going. I, I completely agree. Yeah. I think one of the questions we ask nine times out of 10 when we're interacting with a business owner is what is your gross margin on all of these things? And if it's all mixed and mushy in there and it's not clearly defined through a profit and loss statement, I can produce that day. That usually indicates to me that things are kind of awry on the service providing or the product producing or all that kind of stuff. I want to know exactly what that number is. And I think any business owner running their business, small, large, medium, whatever, like they they need to know that number. That's the yeah. number that truly matters, in my opinion, um, yeah. because you can create better outcomes for yourself if you're always able to manage that number. So we spend a lot of time focusing on those kind of top two categories. Yeah. So something that you said, too, was about, you know... <laughs> Being a service-based business owner, whatever that looks like, a business owner can tend to spend all their time and energy in servicing and then justify it and say it's closest to the dollar, it's highest value. But to your point, if they're not supervising or holding accountable or even in some cases doing the work of marketing and sales, you're going to pick your head up and now you have inconsistent income. And I'm assuming you see that a lot. And that would probably be one of the first things you're looking to fix is that consistent revenue source with um, reducing some of those ups and downs that maybe yeah. a solar, 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 a solo entrepreneur yeah. may have because they are dividing their energy and yeah. time everywhere. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. I think um, we take it one step further. I think everything you said is totally true. I think of it as who on the team can solve the revenue challenge. If I said, turn everything off, everyone's not doing anything, who's going to step up to the plate today and solve the revenue challenge that we have? If no one's able to do that outside of the owner, that's concerning to me. And mm. I've literally sat in meetings with an owner here locally in Austin and had to have that conversation where they had a dip in revenue. Something went over to China to be produced. And I said to him, okay, so what did you guys do? And he shared with me, oh, I did this, 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 and this. And I said, I just want you to know those 17 things that you just listed off actually gives me more pause and more concern because you never mentioned a single other person on the team adding to that value. They couldn't, they couldn't do the vision. They didn't know what, how to react in that moment. That's a huge concern for mine. So when I yeah. think of a business owner where they're actually still turning that wrench or they're the one installing the artificial grass or whatever it may be, and they're unable to have another person solve that revenue challenge in the team, that's more concerning to me. I don't mind if you're the one that's like the best person at turning that wrench and you're able to do that and you're interacting with the customers and they see your face and you're the one on the flyer and they get to see you all the time. That's totally fine. But if you don't have somebody on the team that's able to solve the revenue challenge in the moment, that's where I really, really struggle um, to see a sustainable business. Excellent. So as we close out, do you have any advice for business owners to really be investing in their business for the long term 10 years? Because it sounds like that's all the only lens you think through. So what advice would you give a business owner to get out of the day to day and invest? What would they invest in? Oh, great question. I always back into what we're trying to do. So if, if you told me tomorrow, I want to sell my business for $5 million, which seems to be a number of people really like these days. If I if I say, you know, hey, I want to sell my business for $5 million, I would go through the process and figure out, you know, what's the business currently able to produce revenue and the net profit really, or EBITDA is sometimes the term people use. Um, mm -hmm. I want to know what that is. And I want to back into what does the business size need to get to? And in order to do that, you've got to think through all the different people that need to be a part of the business to get to that size number, to sell the business like that one day. 
and how can they run completely independent of you? Meaning mm -hmm. you do the you know person that fills out the insurance for every single quote that you do, or you're the person that does the quoting itself. How would it look like for you to completely hand that off and turn off your phone for a day? I literally, I mean that. Like you go and you say, hey, this person needs a quote and you turn off your phone for the day, not accessible to them and let them struggle through it. And you'll find out very soon what's missing from a standard procedure to give to them. And as a result, what is missing from your communication that you've always given and what's been, you know, you start learning these holes in, in yeah. the process you've created. So anyways, I think that a business is a constant forming thing that you're continuing to create form around. And one day it might look like a nice shiny thing that Apple looks like today, or it might always be your small little business. And the, de the delta between those, the difference between those two is the decision to bring upon different people that can run autonomously and independently to bring this business forward with you. Yeah. I mean, I think this is great. I think I'm glad that you are a resource for business owners that find themselves in a place and wanting to sell. But on the other hand, I can tell you that if they focused on the things you just said, they may never want to sell. Yep. It's going to be easier. It's going to be less stressful. Their, their profits aren't an issue. All the reasons yep. why someone might want to leave their business and sell out. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that mindset of how you can come into a business and Actually, I just had a thought. I'm assuming that it's easier for you to come into a business because you're not emotionally attached to it. Yep. And so would you offer that advice to a business owner to try and separate the emotion and that I know what this employee's kids do on the weekend and all the things and ask bigger questions? Yeah, that, I think that's totally right. A classic example this week is that we changed the process for our serial numbers that we do on machinery um, that we produce. And they historically were like nine or 10 characters. And now they're 16. And I know that sounds crazy. And people are like, no, why would you go bigger or whatever the case may be? But the reality is it didn't serve the purpose we even needed. It was just a number that sat there. And we have these warranty claims that would come in and we get very confusing. So we built something to serve it. And we just abandoned the old and said, you know, hey, this doesn't serve our purpose. Let's go build something that's going to serve our purpose for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So to your point is, if you can step away emotionally and just sit back and say, hey, hold on a second, if I was not here for two weeks, and I was not involved, what would this business do? Like, would there actually be somebody in the org that brings some energy? Maybe I'm the only one that brings the energy every single day. Like, is there anybody that actually like knows what they're measured by? Oh, wait, they don't know what they're measured by. They only wait for my annual review when I show up. Um, you know, all those types of things, letting that happen. You know, we've got guys that are ready to do their annual review. We took over a business and they have pay bans. Like my supervisors know this is the pay ban. We've budgeted knowing that some of these guys are expected to get more this year. We've budgeted that out. My supervisor, I'm not involved in any of the reviews or any of the process. My supervisors yeah. get to the side. And if my supervisors lose somebody, they've got a KPI that's related to that metric. Okay. Hey, you didn't negotiate well with this guy in the conversation. You know, it takes some of the responsibility and autonomy off of me onto them and it's their team. And then they rev share with us on the back end because they built a team that sustained itself over a long period of time. So yeah. that's the way I think about it. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing your experience with that. How can our listeners find out more about you and what you're doing? Yeah, so you can find us out a little bit more at setsera.com, T-S-E-T-S-E-R-R-A. Happy to take any calls, any questions whatsoever. And we buy exclusively in Texas businesses that have been around longer than 10 years and love to partner with owners that want to transition out of their business, but also would love to just be a part of the local community of business owners um, that are looking to just learn about business and be able to talk them through about what their options might be. And we might be one of their options at the end of the day. So that's our goal. Okay, since you are very geographically located, my question, I told you we were going to end three times and we haven't, but really <laughs> this is my last question, is where would a business owner go to find a similar resource such as you in their local market to even have this as an option for them? Yeah, great question. There's a lot of just like Facebook groups and things like that. That's the first one that comes to my mind of, you know, sell my business and things like that. And there's people in those communities that are buyers like myself. Um, that I would say would be really good. Also, it depends on what, <laughs> to answer your question, hopefully short, There's it's kind of what you want out of it. Do you want somebody like myself that's going to buy the business and hold on to it for the next 10 years? Do you want to sell your business to maybe one of your competition or possibly mm -hmm. a customer that you have or something like that? And that's often called like a strategic buyer. Or do you want to go sell yourself or sell your business to 
a private equity group that will maybe flip your business in the future, but they'll pay you a lot of money on the front end for their opportunity to run your business for a few years. It just depends on what you're trying to do. And so if I'm a small business, um, you know, that's been around for a long period of time, I would start talking to your network and say, Hey, you know, I'm looking to transition out over the next couple of years. Um, love to see what your thoughts are on this business. You've known us for this many years, whether you're my customer or a vendor that you use, you'd be surprised what comes up in conversation. You know, people tend to get excited about the opportunity to, you know, try something new or or experience a business that they admired for a period of time. Absolutely. Well, thank you for closing us out with that. Thank you so much for being here, Malcolm. And I appreciate your time. Pleasure. Thanks so much. I hope you really enjoyed my conversation with Malcolm. And like I said, no matter where you find yourself, whatever season or size your business is, there are actionable takeaways or ahas from this conversation. Whether you're thinking of selling your business or not, putting processes and profits in the center and the focus of the growth of your business, I think is incredibly important. To further support you with that journey, I have a few episodes that I want to link out to, and you can find those in the show notes at amberdelagarza.com forward slash 327. We'll be linking out to episode 201, Always Be Ready to Hire, episode 267, Changing the Game of SOPs and Processes with Jennifer Smith, episode 298, No Systems, No Bueno. And lastly, episode 315, Tracking Operational Metrics to Skyrocket Your Profitability with Marcel Papias. I have loved having you listen to this episode of Small Business Straight Talk. And I sure hope you found my conversation with Malcolm to be insightful, but I need to be straight with you. No change, no change. Without taking action, nothing will change for you or your business. So based on our conversation today, take a moment and decide what is one small action or step that you can take from the knowledge you've learned from today. Perhaps it's the knowledge of prioritizing processes and systems so that you are not the bottleneck of the business, so that you don't feel like the success or failure of the business is solely on your shoulders. Whether you're planning on selling or not, if you're looking for support in creating a business that's focused on both systems and profitability, then I want to help. You can schedule a discovery call and find out more about one-on-one coaching over at amberdelagarza.com forward slash coaching. Again, that's amberdelagarza.com forward slash coaching. And I would love the opportunity to talk to you and talk to you about what partnering with you would look like and find out what your goals are and how we can best accomplish those. If you are new here, I want to say welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss another episode. And if you've been here for a while, please be sure to share this episode with a fellow business owner. So that's my straight talk for today. Until next time, have a productive week.